All right, hello, and welcome to the second presentation of this season's Winter Water Talks. This webinar series is organized for you by the Wisconsin Citizen Lake Monitoring Network and the Water Action Volunteer Stream Monitoring Program. I'm Paul Skowinski, the statewide educator for the Citizen Lake Monitoring Network. I'm also joined here by Katie Bradford and Emily Heald from the Water Action Volunteers Program. Please keep your mute microphones muted today during the presentation and your video cameras turned off. It makes everything run a little bit smoother. If you have any questions for Mike, we ask that you type those into the chat box using the chat button on the bottom of your screen. And Emily and Katie will mostly be holding those questions until the end of the presentation, unless there's one that's specific to a particular slide. Um, the presentation will be recorded today as well, so you can watch it again or you can share it with other neighbors or friends. And I'll share a link to that recording later on today. We're delighted to have Mike Engelson with us today as we wade through the muddy waters of riparian property rights in Wisconsin. Mike is the executive director of Wisconsin Lakes, and he has been since 2013. Um, I think I covered everything on this slide, so I'm just going to turn it over to Mike. Get my slides up, and then we will be ready to go. Okay, you should. Hopefully, I'll be seeing it as well. I see it. All right. Well, uh, good afternoon, I guess, everybody at this point. Um, thanks for joining us today. I'm excited to talk about this. Uh, as Paul said, my name is Mike Engelson. I'm the executive director of Wisconsin Lakes. We are the statewide um, nonprofit organization that uh, works on conservation and preservation of our lake and water resources. Membership is mostly made up of both individuals who care about lakes and lake organizations, both associations and districts. We promote healthy lakes. We provide uh, education and technical assistance to lake organizations through presentations like this and the Lakes and Rivers Convention. Um, we advocate for sound science-based lake policy. Some of you may be aware of the wake boat issue going on right now, I'm guessing probably 99% of you. Um, and so that's an example of where we are advocating at the state level and also trying to help local organizations um, figure out what to do in their own local spaces. Um, and we work with regional and statewide partners to promote and accomplish our mission. Um, we are, as I said, a membership organization. So uh, if, if your lake organization isn't a member and you're interested in finding out more or you're an individual, who likes what we're doing and would be uh, inclined to become a member or donate as well, you can find out all of that information at our website at wisconsinlakes.org. Hey, so what I thought I'd do enough. today is talk both about private riparian waterfront rights in the state as well as uh, public rights, um, and then talk about how those two pieces of law really work together in Wisconsin. Um, we often think of them as sort of butting heads, but I think it's actually better to think of them as sort of mesh together to understand how all of that works. Mike, Before we're having we get some issues it, with though, your audio. If you maybe turn off your video so your audio could come through clear. Yeah, sure. It's so cutting in and out a little bit. All right. Hopefully that's better. Sounds good so far. Okay, good. So I'll start out by saying um, I, I do have a law degree, not a currently practicing attorney. Not all of the topics that um, I'm covering today are things that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, the, the level of depth of understanding on some things, if we go really deep into the weeds, so to speak, um, a great resource for anybody, either attorneys or um, uh, any of you who aren't attorneys, is this book. And I use this as a source for a lot of the background and sort of refamiliarizing myself with some things. It's by an attorney named Paul Kent, who's been around for a long time and uh, continues to work within the water realm, tends to represent um, businesses and industry. Um, but this is sort of just a basic primer of Wisconsin water law. Uh, copyright 2013. He does have some updates to things that are on his website. So if you go to wisconsinwaterlaw.com and uh, once you've bought the book, you can get some updates on things. But it's a, a good general guide to what the state of water law is in Wisconsin. So I recommend that as probably the best primer if you're looking for something. 
So let's get into it. Um, when we're talking about legal things, uh, we like to categorize things and we usually like to categorize things in ways that are um, oftentimes ambiguous and somewhat ill-defined. So you'll hear that a lot throughout this, that there are not always strict black or white answers to questions. Um, in terms of Wisconsin law and how we've pretty much put together uh, categories of, of different types of water, um, these are really the five types. And we'll talk mostly about these first two natural streams and artificial um, streams or lakes. We'll get into what the definition of a stream or lake is in a second. There are also legal things about diffuse surface water. So that would be, for instance, if there's a flood as the water um, flows over the, the ground, there is, of course, groundwater, water that's underground, and there are wetlands. But in terms of, of riparian rights, we're really going to be talking mostly about natural and artificial types. So what do we mean by a stream and what do we mean by a lake? Stream is fairly consistently defined and is um, is is fairly concretely understandable. A stream is a body of water that has a flow and it has some sort of bed and some sort of bank. A lake, on the other hand, the definition is a little bit more wishy-washy. Um, you could call it a reasonably permanent body of water. It's the description that Paul Kent uses in his book. And I like that one a lot. Reasonably permanent. It can shrink. It can expand. It does sometimes have a flow, but generally it's a lake is going to be at rest. The one important thing is that it can have an inlet and an outlet and still be considered a lake. So there are things that are natural lakes that are considered natural lakes that are actually part of riverine systems. That'll become especially important a little bit when we start talking about who owns the title to the bed of the waterway. So those are the definitions for a natural stream or a natural lake. If it's artificial, it can be called artificial in one of two ways. It's either a natural stream or a lake that was altered. So an example of that would be a flowage, a dam is put in, the stream is expanded into um, what becomes a lake. Or it could be a completely human-made water body, so a dug pond or ditch. This is an instance, again, where things are kind of ambiguous in the law. Artificial, as I read it, has not always been consistently used, and it can mean slightly different things if it appears in the state statutes or it appears in case law. So this is kind of just a general definition. It doesn't always absolutely hold true, whether you're calling Flowage sometimes is not really called artificial, but um, under these definitions, I think it would be. So let's quickly go through public rights in water because we have to understand what our public rights are before we can really understand how the private rights uh, dovetail with those. And as I'm sure many of you know, the sort of bedrock doctrine that governs most of our water law in the state of Wisconsin is called the public trust doctrine. This is a legal doctrine that goes all the way back to Roman times, um, flows through common law of Britain and into the United States and was um, placed into the state constitution at the time of statehood. So it's article nine, section one. And basically the idea is that if a water is navigable, it's it's basically the property of the people of the state of Wisconsin. So we all share an ownership in, um, in our waters. And how that ownership and exactly what that means has been defined has changed over time. So originally it was very much centered around the idea of commerce, being able to transport things on waterways. That has expanded through case law and through statutes um, to be a much more um, robust and full right, such that any waters that are navigable in fact, we'll get into that definition in a second, are held in trust by the state um, for the public. So navigable in fact means that you can float a canoe or a small recreational craft 
on a water at some point during the year. That's all it takes for something to become navigable. And I think it's really important to, to talk a little bit about what it means for the water to be held in trust. So that's literally just like money can be held in a trust. So let's say that you're doing your estate planning and you set aside some money in a trust for your child. You don't want them to get access to it when they're 18 or 19, maybe. So you put it in trust until they're 25. That money is managed by a trustee, the person that you've entrusted to, to manage the money for them until they get to that age. Our waters are in trust and the trustee is the state of Wisconsin. So that's why the state of Wisconsin gets to make all these decisions um, about our public waters. And that gives them a duty to protect and promote those public rights, but it also limits their power to, it, the state's power to infringe on those rights as well. So there's a bunch of public interests that, um, again, through case law and statute, have been determined to be part of the public trust and that need to be promoted. So it includes things like um, different types of boating, different types of recreation. It includes aesthetics, so the enjoyment of natural scenic beauty, um, as well as protection of water quality and aquatic habitat. As water flows over land, there again becomes a question of who owns that land, and we'll get into the answer to that question shortly. In general, the public has the right to be on public trust waters. So if you are out floating on navigable waters in the state of Wisconsin, you should be okay. But one question that um, often comes up in this context is, when can I get out of the boat? Um, can I get up on the land if I need to? And this is a place where riparian and public, um, right, public rights intersect. So riparian just means that um, the rights of someone who owns property that borders a waterway. And we'll get into much greater detail on that shortly. The public doesn't have the right to access public trust waters across private property. There has to be some sort of public access. You can't trespass across someone's land. That person may have given an easement that allows you to do so, but they have a right to prevent you from entering their property to get to those waters. You could have a lake that is completely surrounded by private property. The water is still public trust water, it's just very, very hard to access it because there's no access point. If you're out on a lake, um, whether or not it is a, a, a natural lake or a, a flowage or something like that, you have the right to access the riparian, the, the lake bed if you need to, um, but there's a hitch and I'll get to that in a minute too. So another, another little teaser for some information to come. So, but before we move on to the the more private um, more private rights, I wanted to ask a question, and if you want to put your answers in the chat, we can take a couple of minutes and and maybe discuss this. Can you think of some places where some public trust rights might conflict with other public trust rights? So, we talk about riparian and public rights conflicting. What about public user one public users' rights conflicting with another um, user's rights. And if you take a minute and put some info in the chat, so we've got um, recreation versus scenic viewing. Public roads, that's an interesting one. Um, wild rice harvesting, that's an interesting one. That that potentially implicates a whole other set of law um, involving Native American rights that I, I'm not going to be able to have time to get into, but that's, that's interesting um, as an interesting thought as well. Um, recreation versus scenic viewing, boat, swimmer, fisher interactions. Yeah, those are the kinds of things where you have um, uh, 
have to to balance right the right of one type of recreational user against the right of another recreational user um, we see that in the context uh right now especially um motorized craft versus non-motorized and i was waiting for somebody wake boats yeah um so wake boaters have rights under the public trust doctrine they're doing their they have a right to use the water as a state, we also have the duty to protect the rights of other users. And what we often end up having to do is balance those two rights to come up with a, um, a just conclusion uh, to limit the impacts and, and, again, balance things out. I really brought that up only to just illustrate that this isn't always just a private landowner versus um, public conflict. Um, that needs to be that can cause problems. Sometimes it's it's actually public versus public. All right. Take a break for my voice here. And we'll move on to talking about riparian rights. So if you own property that has a shoreline, you have riparian rights, so you must have water frontage, and that property must maintain water frontage. So let's say that you buy a parcel on a lake and you build a cabin on it. You have kids and your, your kid gets a little older, uh, is now an adult, and you let them put a, it's a fairly big parcel, so it, this works out with zoning, just go with it. And it, you, know, the, you allow your kid to put a trailer um, on the upland part of the parcel, um, away from farther away from the lake than the cabin is, say. And then years go by, and you decide that you want to actually um, not just allow him to put the trailer there, but give him that land. When you subdivide that piece of property, the piece that the trailer's on that no longer has water frontage no longer has riparian rights. So as a parcel shrinks, it's only the piece that maintains the water frontage that retains the riparian rights. Just because a particular spot of land at one time came with riparian rights does not mean that it will always have those um, if, they, if the property no longer has water frontage. Riparian rights are also a, a legal concept that have have grown up through the common law, um, kind of like the public trust doctrine does. They, they go way, way, way back um, in world history. In Wisconsin, they are a right to use um, for all reasonable and beneficial purposes. And um, reasonable and beneficial purpose is probably one of the most ambiguous legal terms that you can possibly Find, and it's used all over the law, of course. Uh, and um, but we'll get into us in a second. We'll get into exactly what that might mean in Wisconsin. Before we get there, though, one thing to understand about property rights is that that uh, you learn in law school that um, property property rights are kind of like a bundle of sticks. Um, there, you have property rights that all come together and you can pull out individual specific little rights and riparian rights are no different. So some examples of, of riparian rights in the bundle would include the right to direct or consume water for domestic, agricultural, or industrial purposes, to access water for recreation, um, to use the stream or lake bed, to construct piers and put structures out in the water, um, and the right to add land to your ownings um, by natural process. So this is called accretion and reliction. Accretion is when, say, a lake begins to decline, and that decline is deemed to be fairly permanent. The exposed land even if it was a natural lake and that land was originally owned by the state, that land becomes part of the property of the riparian. 
Um, and we can get in later to later what happens if the water rises again, and that's called the liction. Um, we'll get into that in just a bit. So those are some basic riparian rights, and they sound pretty extreme and pretty full, but they are subject to some restrictions. So the first of which is that concept of reasonable use. As I said, it's ambiguous, um, but it's determined whether or not a particularly activity is a reasonable use of that right in that water um, is a very fact specific decision. So it's based on the facts and circumstances of that particular um, instance of that activity. And it depends on how that activity impacts the public and other riparians, other private um, resources and individuals. Riparian rights are also bound by the public trust doctrine. So they, um, the public trust doctrine has in many cases been deemed to supersede riparian rights, but not all the time. Um, there is sort of a, a meshing and a wishy-washy um, zone in between the two. And then some statutes also uh, have been passed that uh, restrict riparian rights. The biggest probably in Wisconsin and fairly unique to this state, as I understand it, uh, is that riparian rights in Wisconsin can't be conveyed to a non-riparian. So you can't pull the stick out of the bundle that is the right to place structures and sell it to someone else or give it to someone else. You can't sell your right to withdraw water for some um, use to a non-riparian entity. So um, this might come up in the case of, say, a someone that wants to bottle water from a lake or something like that. There are implications um, of a restriction on the rights of the riparian to uh, convey those rights. About the only thing that a riparian can do in Wisconsin is that they they can um, provide an easement that allows access to the water by non-riparians. So you can um, you can put in an easement that allows people to cross your land to get access um, to that public water, and you can see why that would be um, something that we would probably want to promote in the state because we would want the public to be able to use public waters as much as possible. Okay, so um, I've been hinting at this all along. One of the questions that often comes up in the sort of general understanding of riparian rights is who owns the land that is under the water? So let's talk about um, lake and stream beds. In the case of a stream there on the right, you can see that the riparian owns the bed to the middle of the stream. So those, of course, a stream bed, of course, of a stream can change over time. And so that line of ownership is somewhat dependent on time. It does change as the um, stream meanders in the middle of the stream changes. And it, again, it's a very fact-dependent um, determination often made at the moment that it needs to be made for legal purposes. Most of the time, these sorts of like, how much is owned and where are the exact lines, they stay pretty vague until they someone needs to make a decision for a court case or for some sort of transaction or something like that. So riparians basically own the bed of streams. Lakes are different. If it's a natural lake, the state owns the lake bed that's decreed uh, been decreed under the public trust doctrine. If it's an artificial lake, I think it's easiest to think of it as kind of like the stream, the riparian owns the lake bed in front of their property to the mill. So let's say it's just a dug pond. You've got it's a fairly good sized pond. You've got four houses around it. All of those houses are going to own um, the bed to the middle of, of the lake, basically. All of that lake bed is owned privately. There isn't anything that's owned by the state. There's a third category, though, that is more of a hybrid where you have a natural lake. So it was a, a lake that was, you know, has an inlet and an outlet, and it's determined to have been a natural lake. But then say we put a dam on it and it raises the water level. 
That's more of a hybrid situation where the state continues to have ownership over the lake bed at the t- before the time it was altered and the riparian owns any of the land that's flooded in front of them. I'm not going to get into how the um how exactly that determination of what lake bed is owned by the riparian there are, are a couple of different ways that that can be determined. Um it's fairly complicated and I'm just not for time purposes I'm not going to get into that. But this all then begs the question, what about a flowage? So sometimes you have a stream, you don't have a natural lake. This is you know, the case on, on many, many lakes um, all across the state, certainly. The stream has been dammed. It creates a lake. Who owns that lake? The riparian, because it was a stream, continues to own to the middle of the original streamline. Again, there are ways that you can determine um, how this happens. But an important consideration is that that lake bed can be sold or given or parceled out. So a couple of situations where uh, that can be the case. Um, On many rivers in the state, especially the Wisconsin River, um, you've got lots of utility-owned flowages. They were created for hydropower dam purposes. The um, in addition to all of the permitting that would come from the state, they are licensed through um, but the federal government, and there are some restrictions um, that come with those sorts of things. So when the utilities parceled off the shoreline and um, sold those parcels to landowners who would want to live on those lakes, they might come with deed restrictions. So it um, is likely that the utility owns the uh, lake bed, that the riparian only owns up to the water's edge, um, and the rights as a riparian are often restricted because of things that are said in the deed, and that's explicitly allowed by state statute. An even more extreme example of this um, came up in uh, the middle of the last decade. I think the case, um, which was called Moverich v. Lobermeyer, was decided in, I believe, 2018. And then that finding was overturned um, by an act of the legislature um, a couple years later. In this case, it was a brother and sister who both um, had inherited property from their family. Um, The sister owned a waterfront lot and her property ended at the waterline. The brother owned the lake bed. So the brother actually owned the lake bed right in front of the sister's property. The sister, as a riparian, wanted to put a pier in. Um, It was a much more complicated dispute than I'm making it sound like it is right here. Um, There was a lot that went into this. Uh, But the, the brother sued to keep the sister from being able to place any structures off of her shore because he was the owner of that land. And so it's, you know, right to keep people off of your property. Someone can't come on your property and just plop down a shed. Uh, um, And it was the same sort of idea here. The Supreme Court agreed with the brother and ruled that the sister did not have the right to put the pier out into the lake. The legislature said, wait a second, if you're a riparian, you probably bought that property and went into this thinking that you had certain rights. And so the legislature, as is the legislature's right um, itself, decided that the riparian right of being able to place structures into lake bed off their um, property trumped the general private property right of not putting structures on other people's property. Now, that did not mean that all of the public trust um, restrictions on that right to place structures went away. The sister still has to comply with whatever permitting, um, figure out if they have an exemption, and we'll talk about all that in a second. Um, But as far as the question of private, one private property owner versus another, the riparian rights in this case trump the private general private property. How are we doing? Any any questions or anything that I need to? Probably a good place to take a pause, Paul. 
I think we can leave the questions until the end. Okay. Uh, cool. There was there was one the the last one is about property descriptions that that say they end at the high water mark, which I think you've gotten to on flowages. Okay. All right. So the last section of the talk will go into how these two types of rights, public and, and riparian, work together. So this gets back to a slide um, a little bit ago when we were talking about getting out of the boat. The basic rule um, is, is generally called the wet foot rule. So this is especially uh, the case in it in terms of a natural lake, or it's it's easiest to understand in terms of a natural lake, because the lake bed of a natural lake is owned by the state. Riparians have, by riparian right, access to the water line, even if it's below what's called the ordinary high water mark. That's another vague legal term a lot of people have run across it and don't really know what it means. And you can, different people can look at a different, different water body and see different ordinary high water marks. But it basically is exactly what it sounds like. It's the spot on the bank or the shore that is about the highest place that the water would ordinarily get. So the implication of that, of course, is that it doesn't always get that high. Um, there might be times when it's lower than that, and that leaves exposed lake bed. So the question then is, who gets to use that exposed lake bed? It's state-owned because the state owns up to the ordinary high water mark, the lake bed of any natural lake. In Wisconsin, however, we have given a conditional right to riparians to exclusively use that exposed lake bed. So if you're not the riparian, if you're a member of a public in the boat, you can't go onto that dry, uh, exposed lake bed. You have to basically keep your feet wet. That right only comes into play in terms of accessing it. Riparians can't um, unilaterally place structures beyond the order, ordinary high water mark um, beyond what they would normally be able to do if that water was still flooded. So they can't, you know, build a shack or something like that um, past the ordinary high water mark. That especially comes into play when we talk about boat houses and things like that. So if you need to get out of the boat, just keep your feet wet. Otherwise, you potentially are subject to trespass. The public trust, and I should mention that the public trust is probably the is the primary um, source of of a legal basis for regulation around water in the state. There's also a general constitutional concept called the police power, um, which gives a government the right to protect um, health, safety, um, those sorts of things. And so there are pieces of the water regulation scheme in the state that also um, implicate the police power. The legislature over time has uh, sort of codified all of this into mostly, not entirely, but mostly into chapter 30 of the Wisconsin statutes. So there's the statutes. There's also some rulings that came down from courts that are in case law that might also apply but from in terms of the statutes, Chapter 30 is the is the place where most of the public trust in water law happens and can be found. It sets up a, a permit system. So understanding how we are able to use, uh, allowed to use these waters um, is best understood by, by thinking of it through the permit system. There are some things that are exempt from permits. There are some activities that require what's called a general permit. So that's a permit that is passed at the state level. If you meet all the qualifications for it, all you have to do is tell the Department of Natural Resources that you're going to undertake the activity and you should be good to go. 
if it's an activity that's been deemed to have a really high impact and a really high risk of having some um, especially adverse impact, um, then it might the act might require an individual permit. And there's a um, that's where you have to fill out an application, and the actual permit is tailored to your specific instance of conducting that activity. There's a whole set of rules around individual permits that I won't go into today. Mostly today, I want to talk about the exemptions, especially as they relate to structures and waterways, because that's mostly what we're talking about in terms of expressing rights as riparians. Um, so if you want to place structures in a waterway, so whether you be it a pier or fish habitat or something like that, that implicates both the public trust doctrine and your riparian rights and the, the section 30.12 of the state statutes is sort of where um, the whole idea of this permit structure is created. It basically says, unless we tell you differently, you need a permit. The places where the legislature has said you're exempt from a permit include in general, and I may have missed a few, but in general, um, well, first off, a caveat, to be exempt, you have to be a riparian owner. So you, you have to own waterfront property. That property can't, uh, and the area of the activity can't be in an area of special natural resource interest. So those are um, particularly special areas that have been so designated by DNR um, and are listed on their website. And the activity can't interfere with the riparian rights of other owners. So even if you're doing one of these things that would otherwise be exempt, if they uh, interfere, so like if you're putting it pier and it um, crosses over into the your neighboring riparians, riparian zone, um, that exemption would no longer apply. But the kind of activities in general that are exempt, including um, depositing less than two cubic yards of sand, gravel, or stone, if that's associated with another exempt activity, um, structures other than a pure wharf that are seasonal based on DNR rules. So the, act, the, the standards aren't necessarily set out in the statutes, but are left to DNR. Um, fish habitat structures, bird nesting structures, um, boat shelters and hoists, again, all of these in accordance with any standards in the statutes and DNR rules. Um, and what we'll talk about mostly in the rest of our time today, ears uh, and riprap, um, and I didn't put up here, but I have a slide on boathouse rules as well. So let's get into piers. Piers are exempt if the pier is no more than six feet wide. Um, it's basically in three feet. Uh, it extends no farther than um, three feet depth um, or to the point where there's adequate depth for mooring a boat. Um, there are rules in the number of boat slips based on um, 50 feet increments. That second or that third bullet point there sort of shows the uh, the general rule. There's some allowances for some other types of properties as well. And uh, um, despite all the things above, you can have a loading platform that's more than six feet wide, as long as the surface area of the platform entirely doesn't exceed 200 square feet. Any pier that was in place prior to April of 2012 is fully exempt unless the owners were told that they weren't exempt by DNR prior to August 2012, or that peer interferes, is found to interfere with the rights of uh, other right parents. Um, that's a pretty well-defined um, set of standards. DNR has some additional rules. Um, by the way, some of these things on, on all of these categories, peers and riprap and um, other structures in waterways, um, there are statutory standards, and then DNR has rules that um, explain or um, fill those statutes out. Those rules are actually being updated. There were a number of statutory changes over the last few years, and so those rules largely have been updated to accommodate the changes in statutes so that everything um, fits properly, so that the rules aren't 
restricting a person from doing something that is no longer restricted by um, statute. Those rules have not been uh, enacted yet. They are up. I don't know if they've uh, gone out for public comment yet, but they're getting close to being, um, they're getting into the end game of the, of the whole, um, the whole rulemaking process. That would be at least another hour of explanation if I went into it. So I'll leave it at that. There have also been some changes. These are relatively new in the last, um, I think, I think the riprap changes maybe happened in 28, 2019. It's one of those times that was kind of, kind of uh, right just a little bit before COVID. So it seems like it was either like two hours ago or 20 years before, but um, there were some changes to the exemptions for riprap. So you do not need a, peer, a permit for replacing riprap rip on an inland lake or a Great Lakes water body. That's the way the statute reads. Um, for 100 linear feet or less. Um, repair, which basically means moving existing stuff around and adding some, some uh, new rock to, um, to help repair it for 300 linear feet or less, again, on Inland Lakes or Great Lakes water bodies. Note that that does not say anything about doing replacement or repair on rivers. Um, I'm not actually sure how that's been interpreted, if that's ever come up as an issue um, in the uh, since these changes. But for new riprap, you don't need a permit um, if it's 200 linear feet or less on a river or, or inland lake or 300 linear feet or less if it's on a Great Lakes water body, so the shoreline of Lake Michigan or Lake Superior. And then there's those seven conditions for new riprap that also have to be met. Um, in interest of time, I won't go through all of those. But that's much more, much more permissive in terms of doing things with riprap than it has been uh, in the past where there were um, permits required and remember, this doesn't mean that you can't replace 200 linear feet of riprap. It just means that you would need to get a permit to do so. Same thing with peers. It doesn't mean that you know there wouldn't be instances when peers might be approved, but you would have to, that would exceed these conditions, but you would need to go through a permit to get them. And then the last big area that I'll talk about today is boathouses. Um, no new boat houses have been allowed um, beyond that ordinary high water mark um, since uh, late in 1979. Um, and there are two cases where repairs can be made to boat houses um, that exist currently beyond the order high water mark. Um, so they can be repaired as long as the cost of repair or maintain is either less than 50% of the equalized assessed value of the boat house or if it's not a boathouse that is subject to assessment, less than 50% of the fair market value of the boathouse, you cannot place a floor over a wet bay. So if you have, um, you know, you can't convert the um, where the boat was going to go um, into a room where you, into a game room or something like that by putting a floor over it. Uh, the other way that you can do repairs is if the repair or maintenance doesn't affect the size or location of the boathouse. So basically the footprint has to stay the same. Um, the boathouse can't be converted into living quarters. So you can't make it into an apartment for um, your daughter. You've got to give her the trailer up on the uplands. I mean, again, you can't, you can't convert a wet bay into a dry room. Um, there are some other instances when if a, um, if a lake level has been been raised and there there might be a possibility of creating a new boathouse over as long as it doesn't go out over the previous ordinary high water mark. If a boathouse is completely destroyed by a natural event like a storm, it generally can be um, replaced and there are a couple of other exceptions. Um, but those are, those are really the big ones. And then lastly, um, there are a few other things that are covered by chapter 30. 
Um, so um, riparian easements, as I said, that's the that explicitly allows the uh, a riparian to provide an easement for access on their property um, when other riparian rights can't be um, given away or sold. And there are restrictions on things like marina condominiums and um, pyramid lots that are sort of ways that people have tried to get around the uh, you can't give away riparian rights to other people question. Um, regulations on boat shelters and lifts and bridges and culverts and um, fish habitat structures and swimming rafts and things like that. Um, but I think in lieu of going into, into any greater detail on any of that, since those are sort of niche issues, I'll just leave it at that. And that gives us a good 15 minutes to go over uh, any specific questions that people have. So thanks for for listening to my legal lecture and I'll turn things back over to Paul who can try to answer questions. Thank you, Mike. There are lots of questions in the chat. I'm scrolling back up to the top to make sure I don't miss any. Um, there is a question about a uh, lake channel. Uh, so this person lives on a lake where there it's it's a, a large flowage with a channel or several channels that lead back to other people's docks. And uh, the question is, if you have a property that, uh, let me get back to it here. Uh, if you are on a property where one side of the property is on the main body of water and the other side of the property is on the channel, do you have the right to put in two boat slips, one on the channel, one on the, the lake? I am not a hundred percent sure on this, the answer to this, and I would need to I'd need to think about it in in a little more depth and check some things, but I believe the answer to that would be yes. The thing I'm not sure about is, so the number of boat slips that you're able to put in is kind of based on the amount of, of frontage you have. So if you have frontage on both sides of the property, you know, say 100 and 100, I'm thinking that probably counts as 200, but I don't think that you could like put all of the slips on one side. Um, you're working on the frontage on either side, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Okay. Uh, and then coming back to the question about legal descriptions of properties that say they end at the high water mark, is there anything else that you wanted to say about that? I know you did talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I think the, I guess what I would say is if you own property on a flowage, it's um, the the entire problem um, that the problem that came up with the, in the Moverty Low Bar Merit case, and there's another case. Um, that this happened as well. Um, probably the whole thing could have been avoided or often these problems can be avoided if you know what's on your deed. And sometimes there are restrictions that are, you know, go back a while. You don't necessarily always look at these things and they're not actually always, um, realtors don't always um, know to flag them either. So know what's on your deed and know if there are restrictions because just because you normally would have particular rights as a riparian does not mean that they are always um, going to exist. Um, and that can be especially true in the case of, of um, property on a, on a flowage where you're uh, part of a hydroelectric project and there's a lot of other levels of government that are, you know, maybe placing restrictions on what the utility is. Okay, the next question is about nuisance animal control. Uh, what what rights do owners have as far as mitigating any damages from nuisance animals? Beavers were brought up in particular in the comment. Yeah. Um, that is, a, that's probably outside the scope of chapter 30. Um, it definitely has, uh, and there, there may be somebody else that knows the answer to that question better than I do. Cause I admit to not, not necessarily knowing the exact answer. Um, any kind of animal activity I think is at least 
partially it, it, there are public trust implications in how that gets managed um, where because that's part of sort of the whole natural environment of the water body right so the this the state would have some role in uh in playing on that but i simply don't know what the um exact regulations are on that i apologize okay if you want to reach out to me offline i can get an answer on that i knew there would be ones that i didn't think to look up right Next question is, in a case where a private deeded property ends above the ordinary high water mark, and there's a small strip of dry land, uh, I think this is referring to um, the water level maybe going down. Uh, there's a small strip of dry land then between the private property and the lake bed. Is the private landowner still considered a riparian and, and owning up to that water line? So I think what you're saying is that there was a piece of property where at one time, maybe that the property went to the, um, went to the water's edge and then the water at some point receded. Um, so that would be one, one situation where I could see this would come into play in that case. Um, as long as that recession of the water is fairly permanent and that's would be a determination that would have to be made on a legal basis. Uh, you know, that would be fact specific to the, the particular situation. But in general, if, if that, uh, you know, is, is something that is not going to go away, it's not part of the natural fluctuation of the lake level, then that land that has become exposed is part of that uh, riparian's property. Okay. The next question if is it was so the other the other way I could see that play is if you had a had a a lot um kind of similar to the one in the that the sister had in the Mober Free Lobermeyer case where the the landowner didn't actually own any lake bed. And so maybe it was a, a very weird, weirdly designed lot. If that lot never had waterfront never had shoreline, wasn't right up to the shoreline, that lot was never had any riparian um, rights. It's, would, it would be whoever would own that strip of land between the water and the other property line. Um, but that would seem to me like a fairly odd circumstance. Okay. Next question is on a natural lake where the state owns the lake bed, could somebody pull up to a privately owned dock and use it since the, the end of the dock there is on public land? Read that one again. If you're on a natural lake where the state is owning the lake bed, could somebody pull up in a boat? I think uh, this is assuming pull up to the end of the dock on a boat and use the dock, even though it's privately owned because the end of the dock is located on the the state-owned lake bed got it um i i believe that uh believe that you can pull up to the dock you can't necessarily get on the dock because that's private property um, unless there is some sort of emergency situation where you need to get out of the watercraft because it's sinking or something like that um but then it's allowed, but you need to vacate that private property as quickly as possible. So the structure, um, it would be, I think, the same for a swim raft. You couldn't just um, pull up to a private swim raft and jump on it and use it to swim or something like that. Okay. What about mooring to that dock? Would that be, I assume that would be using the private property, so not allowed? If yeah, I want to say fleet. that that actually is something that is um, potentially up for clarification, and I don't remember exactly how a DNR was clarifying that in the rules. Um, so again, if you if you want a more specific answer to that and how it might work out in the future, um, reach out to me offline, and I'll I'll try to get you the answer on that. Okay. Next question is: If you purchased a property that has a pier and the end of the pier is deeper than three feet 
do does this person need to make sure there's a permit on file for that peer uh yeah i believe so that just because you um you know you purchased it it's uh and if it was if you purchase something that was um not proper uh then the not properness you inherit the not properness now it might be that it was um it was a peer that was exempted or is you know very old or something like that and that's why it's in that state and it was allowed to be and would continue to be um uh you know, so I think, well, let me put it this way, to conform to the law, you should definitely um, check into it to make sure that you're compliant to avoid any surprises. How is that? Sounds good. If, uh, if a person suspects there's a violation of Chapter 30, who do they report that to? So DNR is uh, the agency that has been given the power by the legislature to enforce Chapter 30, generally speaking. Um, so definitely you can contact part of the agency that would be um, uh, proper within, uh, depending on what the violation is. So if it's a structure in the waterways, there's a waterways um there's there's a part of the department that deals specifically with that and so you can can contact them um that's probably the 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 best place to start is it the most always the most fulfilling um you know the i was last week i did a a, a seminar um, with some other people presenting on the Clean Water Act, and they were talking about how the Clean Water Act, the idea often is to um, get things into compliance rather than penalize for violations. And I think that's generally true of most regulations um, in the state in relation to waters. And so I think if there are um, the actions that would be taken would be probably less um, towards penalizing that person than trying to get them into compliance with what the, the law would be. Okay. Can you talk about permanent peers? Uh, this person says they're starting to see more permanent peers going in. So I've heard that. Um, honestly, I don't, uh, I haven't seen any, any data on how many there are or, um, you know, how prevalent that is becoming. So I don't know that I have a whole lot to, to, to talk on that, unfortunately. Okay. Um, we have about uh, about 20 more questions. Uh, it is about one o'clock. Mike did agree that he can stick around for a little bit longer. So Mike, do you wanna maybe take 10 more minutes of questions and then anything else people can email you directly? Sure, that sounds that good. Sounds fair, okay. So the, the next question Hopefully is- Hopefully I'll be able to answer a few of them. <laughs> <laughs> the next one is regarding a stream. If you were wading down a stream and you encountered a log jam or a culvert or a low bridge, uh, something that is preventing you from continuing down the stream. Can you get out of the stream and go around uh, above the high water mark to go around that obstruction? Uh, yes, I believe that you can, can just for that purpose, just to get around an obstruction. Um, if, if you're on a stream, you can, can get out and get around. Yeah, and I believe the rule is you have to just get back to the stream as, as fast as you possibly can, right? Yeah, anytime that there is an allowance for entering on private property, the general rule of thumb would be get off of it as quickly as possible. <laughs> okay. Uh, next question is, is the state working on statewide wake boat regulations? <laughs> um. So the answer to that question is a qualified yes. There are statutes, there are bill, there is a bill um, that is out there that Wisconsin Lakes currently does not support. Um, there are some potential amendments. We've heard a lot of different rumors about what an amendment might look like, um, but we really don't know. I have, I, I honestly have no more information as to whether or not anything is going to get a hearing um, before the end of this legislative session, which is um, probably going to end at the end of next month. So um, 
in, in many ways, your guess is as good as mine, but we are, um, we're trying to get a bill that would uh, adequately protect private property um, uh, while maintaining the, uh, you know, we, how we would believe would um, provide adequate public trust protections as well. So that um, could go a number of ways. Okay, the next question is about snowmobiling. Uh, it sounds like, uh, I think it, the person is wondering if a snowmobile is, is driving down a frozen creek, I believe, uh, and there's a tree blocking the creek, could a snowmobile go around that obstruction onto private land? That's, I don't know the answer to that one. I hadn't, never, I hadn't thought about that in terms of like winter use. I would be kind of surprised. That would seem like a fairly heavy intrusion of equipment onto private property. Um, so I kind of, I kind of doubt it. Um, I've had, I had that question of like things that are happening on ice Come up recently, um, and I've been trying to research um, what exactly the how what happens on frozen water compares to what happens on um, on liquid water uh, works, and I haven't um, found all of the answers yet. But I actually there's enough questions about that and different ways that could play out that I think that um, I think that you could. Uh, that that it would make a good article that um, I'm hoping to put together um, sometime in the near future. Okay. Can you touch on uh, lake property owner practices and, and rights as far as lighting and tree cutting? Yeah. That again is an area that I didn't prep for this morning, um, but I will give you the general gist of of what I recall, and I'm, I know that there are other people on here that can probably answer that off the top of their head as well. Um, there are very few restrictions uh, as to lighting. Um, that was a point of pretty heavy contention a few years ago when the Shoreland zoning statutes were changed, um, where um, the 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 standard for um, prohibiting certain types of lighting was removed and the ability of local government to pass any kind of restrictions that aren't in the statutes removed. And so um, uh, there's, there's not a whole lot, as I understand it, that can be done about lighting. Um, as for tree removal, um, Depends on where the trees are on the property, certainly. Um, I think I'd feel more comfortable looking that information up because I don't remember that off the top of my head well enough to make a coherent statement. Hey, Mike, this is Dan Butkus. I can answer that one, actually. I knew Dan would come in handy at some point on this. That Dan is uh, the new president of Wisconsin Lakes. So thanks, Dan. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, generally, anything that happens above the ordinary high water mark is governed by uh, either statutes in 5962 or by local zoning ordinances. So that would, you know, anything regarding lighting, felling trees uh, within 35 foot setback, uh, all of that. Um, basically, the way to look at it is. If it's above the ordinary high water mark, it is the responsibility of the county to regulate. Below the ordinary high water mark, it's the DNR. So that that's kind of the quick and dirty answer to that question. Perfect. That's what I would have would have thought, um, but I didn't want to do say that without having some. <laughs> Uh, looked it up a little more. What else? Now the next one is how is the ordinary high water mark determined on a lake with significant fluctuation in water level? Uh, yeah. Mike, I can answer um, that one too. It's Dan again. Yeah, go on. <laughs> uh, generally, uh, 
the DNR does not set the ordinary high water mark. I have asked that question of the DNR, and their answer is, we do not set it. It is the county. I've asked the county zoning department, for Oneida County, uh, if they would set the ordinary high water mark, and they said no. When, whenever they deal with ordinary high water mark for uh, placement of boathouses, they do it on a case by case basis. It's situational. So um, unless you're talking about a flowage, so the example of no Lake Nokomis north of Tomahawk, uh, the Wisconsin Valley Improvement Corporation owns the land underneath the flowage and generally about 30 feet up upland uh, from the water. Uh, technically, people who own property around Lake Nokomis aren't riparian owners, but um, the WVIC allows them access to the lake. Um, but um, I think I just lost where I was with that answer. <laughs> I think and it, um, it, it's entirely possible that um, people in other parts of the state may have gotten have had a different experience with the ordinary high water mark. It's uh, as I said before, it's one of those very vague places in the law where there's not a lot of definement. Um, there's different ways that it can be determined. Um, and it generally is left uh, as an open question until it needs to be answered. That can cause problems in and of itself because it's often determined like only on a portion of a lake and then it's determined differently not that far away and so it's it's not like there's some database where you can go to to figure out what the ordinary high water mark is for any water body in the state um, and different people might determine it differently so All right, the next question is about uh, if in the case of a very small cove or bay, in this case, 100 feet wide, how do the riparian property lines project into that cove if there are four owners around the cove? Yeah, um, I used to know this really well because I did this, I had this question once when I was an attorney and I, I um, I'm trying to remember exactly how it works. There are a couple of different ways that it can be determined. Um, it obviously goes out to the point where they meet. Generally, the standard, I think, is to try to create uh, as um, equal an amount of, of space for each riparian as, as possible. But that's the... You know, the problem there, I think if probably you're getting at is that that's not very wide. And so there's not, if you're talking about putting peers in and things like that, you can't interfere with another riparian's peer. And you could almost, there's very little room for a navigational channel there. Um, so how that would actually play out in terms of what you're able to do um, with your riparian property with, with the riparian zone, um, I it's very fact specific, and so I, I don't know that I can can give a complete answer to that one either. Okay, and can you touch on rafts? Uh, another particular kind of raft mentioned is the trampoline type of raft, uh, since these are not anchored to the bottom or they are anchored i suppose but there's no permanent uh, structure like a pier leg or anything in there are these considered usable by the public since they're just sort of floating on the water uh i would say no they would not be considered usable um, by the public and i believe that was one item that uh there was going to be some changes in the the rules relating to them um in this new rulemaking that's coming up um so uh, I can, if you're especially interested in that, um, but again, reach out to me and I'll, I'll look that up and figure out exactly what the change, uh, is going to be as to how those are treated in terms of your rights to put them out. Um, but, uh, just cause it's just cause it's floating free doesn't mean that, I mean, you can't like a boat is floating free and it doesn't mean that you can just jump onto another boat. <laughs> so 
it would be the this, this, this same sort of principle. Okay. I think we'll take one more question here. Uh, the next one in line is, can farmers string fences across streams in order to restrict cattle from wandering? Oh, good. It was an easy one to finish up. But the answer to that would be no. You can't because as long as the stream is a navigable water, uh, you can't do anything to place a barrier um, across the stream um, that would prevent anyone that was going down it from uh, traveling uh, uh, down it. So that's not the case in some parts of the country. I know that uh, that uh, that's um, fairly common, um, but that would not be allowed in Wisconsin. Now, there might be some artificial uh, waterways, um, drainage ditches, or something like that where they are are not considered um, navigable. Generally, they're you know if it's artificial and it doesn't connect to a navigable waterway, um, then it's probably not considered navigable, and there the landowner could could probably do that, but not on a natural stream for sure. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Mike. There were a ton of questions. There's still more. Uh, if anybody didn't get their question answered, uh, you can reach out to Mike directly. Mike, could you put your email in the chat? and people Bet. can contact you directly. Uh, a couple other reminders. We uh, I want to remind everybody that the Wisconsin Lakes and Rivers Convention registration is about to open. So keep, your, uh, keep an eye out for that. Mike is always at the convention and usually gives a couple of great presentations. So you could corner Mike sometime during a meal maybe and ask him a couple more questions. Uh, the other reminder is that our next winter water talk is on key factors that affect stream and river health with Mike Miller from the Wisconsin DNR. That will be on February 15th at noon. So thanks everyone for joining us today and we hope to see you back here next month. Thanks everybody.